This interview is the second half of an episode of my new podcast, The Explanation. So if you want to listen to the full episode, be sure to subscribe by clicking the link in the description or on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, Marianne. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great. So the what we talked about in the podcast today was issues related to children and education. And specifically, we talked about your whole student's plan. And it proposes a lot of reforms to American education. But American education is pretty decentralized compared to most countries where local uh, jurisdictions and states have a lot of control. And while the federal government does have some tools to try to influence what goes on, most of the decisions don't lay in their hands. So my first question is, I was wondering what you think is the most practical way to implement a systemic education reform in that kind of a system? Well, first of all, we need to rethink uh, what a practical way of strategizing something means. You know, in business, it is now understood. You can't just dictate to employees, this is what we're going to do now. Life doesn't quite work that way. You need to enroll people. So in politics, we jump right into what are we going to do when the first question is, what is the result that we really want? And to enroll the country in that. So, for instance, um, JFK didn't send a missive to NASA and say we are going to land a man on the moon in 10 years. He said to the American people, we are going to land a man on the moon in 10 years. That engaged the American imagination. And that is more than metaphor. That is more than symbol. It became a national goal. And because so much of the country was enrolled in that goal, it made possible implementation uh, and agendas and strategies that would not otherwise have been available. So the first thing we need to do is to enroll the American people in the idea that every school in America, every public school in America should be a palace, a world-class palace of culture and learning and the arts. That's the first thing. What is it we're seeking to achieve? When I was running for president, I was so moved by the what's called the governor schools in South Carolina. And actually, I have been told that these governor schools, this model also exists in other states, although I have not, or at least I think in one other state, although I haven't seen it. And the governor school, there was one in math and science and one in arts and the humanities. They are public schools. Uh, there's tremendous competition to get in. And I'm telling you, if either of you walked with me through these schools, you go, oh, I want to go here. It, it was unbelievable. This is what it should be for every school child in America. That's the first thing. Let's lay out the goal. Let's also, uh, as it were, quote unquote, sell the American people on the realization that right now China is supposed to be ahead of us economically by 2028. There are certain things that absolutely must occur if the United States is even have an opportunity to even compete as a, as a, as a world power the way we have been used to uh, over the next 20 or 30 years. The next thing we need to recognize is that there are tens of millions of American children who live in who go to schools who live first of all in chronic trauma a lot of which is related not only to their homes but to their schools we have tens of american uh, millions of american children who go to school every day in schools that don't even have the resources to teach a child to read child who can't learn to read by the age of eight is on that school to prison pipeline chances of high school much uh much reduced chances of high school graduation, reduced chances of incarceration drastically increased. And we have millions of American children who go to schools who, because of the public funding issue that you have pointed out, are doomed or shackled from a very, very early age because they will not, because of our funding, be able to get the kind of educational opportunities that uh, kids in in um, higher um uh, more economically advantaged situations uh, will get. We need to discuss the fact that our economic system was devised before women were part of the public debate. And child raising was just seen as something that, you know, oh, that was women's work. Well, we are part of the uh, of the debate right now. I saw how, you know, Sylvia just raised her hand. 
This is something the American woman should not stand for. We're here now. We have a voice. And feminism should not just be a voice about opportunities for women. It should be an opportunity for children as well. We need to have these larger conversations about how capitalism, because capitalism has no use for children or the elderly. And because our our political system, due to the undue influence of corporate money on our political system, our politics is guided more by corporatist values than by humanitarian values. We shouldn't be run like a business. We should be run like a family. So we need to deal with the fact that our government now systemically neglects the needs of children. It's peripheral. So even when you ask me a question like, what would be your plan? It's still like, given the fact that children are systemically neglected in America, how could we maybe make it a little better? And what we do is we end up wasting millions because we're not spending billions. We need to enroll the American people in the idea that we need a massive front ending of our resources in the direction of children. And I mean massive. We, the, by the age of three, 80% of, of brain development is accomplished. By the age of five, 90% of brain development is accomplished. We have children, the, the, the current establishment, it, as far as they can go, is we should have universal preschool. It is so much bigger than that. We have children who are traumatized before preschool. We have children in, in elementary schools in America who are on suicide watch. So when you ask me what's the plan, the first plan is to have a conversation that we're not yet having, where we unabashedly proclaim that we have such a crisis here, that childhood in America is a, a children in America accept the children of the 1% who, who, most of whom don't even send their kids to public schools, are, are facing a, a trauma that we pay for. We pay for it in terms of mental health crises later in their lives. We pay for it in terms of delinquency. We pay for it in terms of crime. We pay for it in uh, terms of incarceration, although part of the obscenity there is then the incarceration itself is turned into a, uh, into a profit center uh, for that matter, depression is turned into a, de um, a profit center. So that, that's my answer to you is we need to back up and just really put it on the table that what is needed is a massive shift, a massive change in our ultimate goal and move back from there. Yeah, I'm very sympathetic to the idea of rethinking system our entire approach to education systematically. And I think to most things, because like with most things in our society, education was built to advance capitalism, where the purpose of women under capitalism was to create more workers and the purpose of education was to c turn people into workers. And so if we are going to try to move away from the idea that people are machines of profit and nothing more than that, then part of that has to be to rethink education. Uh, you talked a little bit about the finances also, and um, that was something I wanted to ask you about because we talked in our first episode when we were talking about redlining and housing inequality and how that affects schools about how a lot of schools, like you said, are underprivileged because of where they are and the way that they are tax funded, at least um, largely through property taxes. And I, I think that it's probably impossible to change some of these systemic inequalities in our schools without addressing the way that they're funded and the way that the value of homes in the area affects the quality of schools. So would you propose to reform that funding model? And what would uh, what do you think it would look like? Well, there are a lot of uh, areas in which this funding model is already being worked on. I mean, this is not like a new subject. And um, there are states uh, and there are federal programs that have made it uh, there can be mandates. There can be minimum standards of mandates. There can be uh, grants to the states. There can be a mandate on a federal level that a certain um, uh, a, a certain minimum of quality is to be achieved and that where the state budget will not handle it uh, in terms of compensating for certain neighborhoods that federal funds will be made available. That's math. That's technical. The, the first issue is that we have to change the consciousness to know that it is to, to the point where people get that it is unacceptable for any child in America to receive less than the highest quality. And when I say the highest quality, I mean the highest quality. I mean a world class education, which only a massive, a massive change, not only in funding structure, but in operation would achieve. 
you wanted to create a department of children and youth, uh, and youth, excuse me, focused on improving the lives of the children. Uh, and one of its immediate tasks was to conduct a whole study on all department programs related to anyone between the ages of zero and 18, uh, and identifying specific ways to improve their quality of life. And obviously you don't have that report, uh, but you probably have some ideas that you think could be tackled quickly and effectively. Uh, and also one thing that we haven't really touched on is a lot of the ideas that you had were developed pre-pandemic and a lot of the issues that you were saying were bad enough before we were thrown into this chaos of the pandemic that has just exacerbated all of the problems and all of the things that you wanted to address with the whole child program addressing social and emotional needs that now have become completely obvious to everyone, not just us parents. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? As as you just said yourself, these situations existed pre-pandemic, and many of them have been made more uh, obvious because of the pandemic. The issue is much bigger than education. I know one of the words you keep using, Ian, is education. This is much bigger than education. This is nutrition. This is health. Uh, this is social and emotional learning. This is the fact that even if you have a world class school, if the child goes back home and, you know, the home is in dire poverty and all of the dysfunctions that are statistically are so probable, uh, within, uh, certain situations, then it's not going to change. So we need the idea to me of a, um, Department of Children and Youth is that you convene a lot of the problem solving that we need in the 21st century will come from convening experts that are multidisciplinary because as we approach a whole, a whole person perspective on any kind of systems change, we now have to apply that to politics. So this would be child psychologists. This would be neuroscientists who, who have information about the development of a child brain early childhood. It would have to do with nutrition. It would have to do with health. It would have to do with maternal health. It would have to do with health of a pregnant woman. It would have one of the things we need is vast new funding for our library system. Uh, many of the programs that uh, mothers want to go to with their children, mommy and me type programs, these should be available. They should be free. They should be at you at, um, at, at um, libraries, there should be a recognition that there is no power in the wind or in the sun or underneath the ground or in any of the natural um, uh, sectors that can compare to the potential power of a child's brain, of the human brain, period. So uh, what we need to do is bring all together all these areas of expertise, most of which do not have a serious voice in the way our government functions, because our government continues to uh, put it into things like education, smaller child, uh, smaller cl size classrooms, which are important. But the level of crisis at this point is so much greater than that. It, it, we're, we're like the political system, just there's no authentic truth telling here for how serious this problem is. And so we need to start at the beginning and here, see, it, in this area to me, as in so many, America does not lack the genius. We don't lack the problem solvers. We don't lack the projects. We don't lack the people who understand what a child needs in order to thrive, what a family needs in order to thrive, what is necessary nutritionally, what is necessary on all these levels. What we lack is a space in the public dialogue where this is then a conduit that makes, uh, becomes a conduit that makes its way into our political uh, operational uh, conversations as you were talking about before, Ian. Did that answer your question, uh, Sylvia? There was a lot there. Did I, did I, is there anything I left out? You said a lot of really good things. Um, I'm just really, do you think we have a chance of pressuring those in power to think about creating that Department of Children and Youth? Because you pointed out how it is not just about educating them and reducing small class sizes, but also focusing on their nutritional needs, the fact that a lot of them depend on free or reduced price lunches and that we need to actually give them the necessary food to start their day. And by the way, lunch is already the second meal, but if they came hungry, 
uh, and arrived at eight o'clock or whenever they arrive at school, the first half of the day is already wasted because they're starving. Um, and if they didn't have a home, even before the pandemic and so many people at risk of being evicted, if they don't have a place to call their own, they slept in their car, then it just has so many levels. Right. So the most important thing you said was pressuring those in power. This is the deal. And I say this to both of you as young people. Do I think we have a chance of pressuring a 65 year old man who has a lot of money in the bank and whose kids have been to private school? No, I don't. What we need is for the two of you to run for office. That's what we need. We need to replace those people. Uh, we're past the point of trying to pressure those people. They don't get it and they won't get it. When somebody who, who, who can afford to buy, who can afford to buy a $600 pair of shoes is mulling over whether or not it is reasonable to give $300 to someone who cannot afford food. There is, this is not about pressuring that person. This is about replacing that person as a lawmaker. What we need is a massive infusion not just in terms of who you vote for, but in, in turning the popular imagination among people, really such as yourselves, to actually running, getting your friends to run, become active in campaigns. And a lot of the what we're talking about, as you said yourselves at the beginning, is on a state level. I mean, look at what Texas is doing. Texas is passing a law that teachers cannot talk not only about race, but any current events. Now, people on the left who are more likely to be having more of the conversations that you guys and I are having, there is a tendency to get all excited about the hot and sexy presidential campaigns, maybe the midterms, but there's not enough of an adrenaline rush or it is so perceived on the school board and state elections. That is what is needed. We need a shift in consciousness about electoral politics, and that has to go beyond uh, just who you vote for, because on the um, even on the primary level is where so much of this contest is. Because if, even if you're in the Democratic Party and you just get the corporatist candidates, then it's just going to be a better version of the same old, same old. They think they're they're so great and progressive because they're saying we should have free preschool. And as Sylvia said, it is so much bigger than that. So when you say, do I think we can pressure them? I think at this point you need to shift into no, but you could replace them. Um, you mentioned the uh, teach these law in Texas and the teaching of current events and racism. And I actually want to ask you about one of the points in your whole child plan specifically. You say in your website that you want to restore the teaching of American history and civics in order to teach American values in our democratic system of government. And as you alluded to, that's been pretty heated in the last few years of people, as people have been talking about the history of white supremacy in America and the Confederacy. And there have been things like the New York Times, the 1619 project and retaliation projects like Donald Trump's 1776 project and Texas's 1836 project. So I just wanted to ask you if you could elaborate a little more on what your vision for that is. We are living at a time where there are people on the right who only want to talk about what America has done right and have no listening for what America has done wrong. There was a big brouhaha several years ago with the uh, textbooks, uh, it was Houghton Mifflin, and it had to, it was centered around Texas at the time, where basically they want to give Martin Luther King maybe like one paragraph. Uh, I mean, it's unbelievable the, the whitewashing and the re revisionist history that the right will introduce. But there's another level of revisionist history that you see on the left. Just as there are people on the right who have no listening for what we've ever done wrong, there are people on the left who have no listening for what we've ever done right. And I think either extreme is dangerous. The truth of the matter is you can look at the Declaration of Independence, okay? I'm sorry, the Declaration of Independence is incredible. It is one of the most amazing documents. And it is the first document that ever established within the founding of a country the very idea that all men are created equal, the very idea that all men are given by God the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, it is true that 41 of the, uh, of the 56 signers of the Declaration were slave owners. First of all, I point out to you that means, what, 15 were not, not all of those 
those people were. But more than that, what is baked into the cake at our founding is that contest. And that struggle is reiterated with every generation. We both represent the most enlightened ideals on which any country was ever founded. And we have represented from the beginning, slave owners at the very beginning, genocide of Native Americans, segregation, and obviously the overreach of crony capitalism as it exists today. Our generation is dealing with these same things today. The, what our children need to know is that both are there. Both have always been there. But the more you know about what the ideals are, the more you know about what the Bill of Rights is. If you have a generation that wasn't taught what the Bill of Rights is when they were children, they don't know as adults to be horrified when it's under attack. And there are millions of Americans, obviously, the only real, you know, the Bill of Rights is 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. The only one they know about clearly is the second one. Right. Well, what went wrong that they're not aware of the other nine? So what happened about 20 years ago is there was all this talk about STEM, about this emphasis in school on teaching science, technology, engineering, going back to the economic values. And that was too often at the expense of art, at the expense of the humanities, at the expense of culture and at the expense of history. We have uh, states that don't even require half a year of um of, of, of um, learning schools, uh, classes in civics and government and American history. Now, I believe, even though my, my politics are on the left, I understand that there are high-minded conservative uh, values and high-minded liberal values. And so there is a way to teach American history, to teach civics, that's based on this is what these documents say. I'm sorry, this is what these documents say. And then within that, you can have a conversation about this is where America has embodied what we say we believe in. This is where America has not embodied. But the, but the arc of American history is such that we do tend to self-correct and children need to understand this. Children need to know we had slavery and they need to know about abolition. They need to know about the institutionalized suppression of women and they have to know about the women's suffrage movement. They need to know about segregation and the institutionalized uh, suppression of, uh, of, 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 of black people. And they need to know about the civil rights movement. So I, I believe that, that we need both. I think it's just like when a person is looking at our own life. Where have I gotten it wrong? Where have I gotten it right? I'm both. A nation is people. We've gotten it wrong and we've gotten it right. Let's take a good look at all of it see where our behavior has and has not been aligned with our own values and uh, celebrate where they have been because we haven't done everything wrong. Celebrate where they have been, commit even further to making sure we do stand on our values and um, atone for and repair where we've done it wrong and where unfortunately even today we are doing it wrong as well as right in various ways. Does that make sense? Yeah, I do think it's uh, very important to teach history and civics, and that civics especially has not been uh, taught much. I, it's been said that the one of the best criticisms of democracy is that it allows people to outsource understanding issues and rely on other people to understand them for them. But I feel like a lot of what a lot of people would say to push back against that is that the the triumphs of America that you've been describing, the abolitionism, uh, the civil rights movement, that's not the stuff that gets um, de-emphasized. Every history class has to make choices about what it emphasizes and doesn't. And a lot of people would probably say to you that that's not the stuff that gets de-emphasized right now. The stuff that gets de-emphasized is like you talked about slavery and the genocide of Native Americans and stuff. So do you see that, that being de-emphasized? No, I think a good teacher teaches both. I, I mean, I mean, I mean right, right now. Both. The, 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 point of our, the point of our history is the struggle between the two. Proper teaching is both, just like proper looking at yourself is both. And I think, you know, when you say it becomes de-emphasized, I think that neither needs to be de-emphasized. I think they're both extraordinarily important. And there are a lot of, I mean, that's what, his, that's what going to class is about. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
<laughs> let's tell the truth here. And the truth is that we've gotten it terribly wrong. And the truth is that there have been generations that have stood up very courageously and changed things that were wrong. And those generations did not owe us anything. When, when we're standing up to correct the, correct the wrongs in our own time, we will have the right for all this cynical lambasting of other generations who got it wrong. There, there were people, we, we are heir, yes, we are heir of a country that had those terrible things such as, such as slavery, but, but we are also heir of the legacy of abolition and the incredible sacrifices and, um, um, uh, uh, struggles that were involved there. And correct education is teaching children that all of those things happened. You pointed out that when we focused on STEM, a lot of things like arts and humanities and history got de-emphasized. And part of your proposals were about the whole student approach that went just that went beyond just teaching the academic, but also including some of the social and emotional development. And there are some schools that are introducing mindfulness and meditation. Uh, and there's, from what I've seen, some great stories of success on what it can do for children. Can you tell us more about, for example, cases where you've seen that it's been introduced, that it's prioritized? Uh, yeah, tell us, uh, focusing on what actually works, right? Yeah, you, well, you're absolutely correct. I mean, one of the things uh, running for president was very exciting was seeing um, all over the country that there are, as I mentioned earlier, there are problem solvers, the people who know what to do to repair this country and move us into the 21st century in a, in a thriving way. Um, unfortunately, they are under resourced. They are under, they are not so much disempowered as they are not given power. So I meet people in all of those areas who do extraordinary things to change children's lives. Unfortunately, however, when I would ask them, uh, how many of the kids who need these services, uh, get them? Often, uh, I would get eerily the same answer. Uh, if I would say in this school district, how many, th how many of these success stories that you were telling me about actually reach children? And I would be told 10% over and over and over again. I would be told 10%. A lot of it has to do with nutrition. We have kids even who are getting, um, uh, food at school who are getting crap from the food, uh, big food companies. Whereas we have there, it has been proven. Uh, by Mark Hyman's organization and various others, the extraordinary difference uh, that healthy, nutritious food can make. We have to remember how many millions of Americans live in food deserts where they don't even have an opportunity uh, to give their children uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. I was reading just the other day about, <laughs> this one is just mind-blowing to me. I was reading a paper the other day about how they're now allowing yoga in the schools in Alabama, but they're not allowed to say namaste and they're not allowed, I know, they're not allowed to use any of the, of the, um, uh, the Sanskrit languaging that has to do with naming the positions, which is just hilarious to me. So you, you, you read stories all the time, whether it has to do with nutrition, whether it has to do with reading programs, whether it has to do with community wraparound services, whether it has to do with trauma informed education. We know what to do. It's not like we don't know what to do. There are people who know what to do. That is what is so tragic. Just like there are people who know what to do to introduce regenerative agriculture. That we have people who know what to do to uh, fight climate change. We people we have people who know what to do to provide solutions in so many areas. But we do not have a solution-oriented perspective on political or social change. And that is because political social change is now held hostage to forces that have more to do with the corporatist mentality of just increasing short-term profits for huge multinational corporations, which too often are the problem creators themselves. So when you say are there, there, are, there are solutions everywhere, everywhere you go, this is the try. I see it everywhere. But you know, um, what we have is a situation where no matter how wonderful, uh, no matter how wonderful all these solutions are, if we do not, going back to you guys, electing, if we do not elect the people who recognize that this is where our funding should go, 
then unfortunately the solutions will be there, but they will not be operationalized. They will not be uh, included in uh, the way the system operates and the suffering and the decline will continue. Thank you. Well, before we finish up, do you have anything you want to plug? Oh, I, I, yes, there is one thing I want to say about that. Um, and this goes back to what Sylvia just said. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, you see a program on some television show about somebody who escaped. They escaped these terrible situations, and now they're going to Princeton. They escaped these situations, mm -hmm. okay? American childhood should not require escape. That's really what this is about. Why should American childhood be a condition that requires rescue and escape? Another thing I'd like to point out is this issue of meritocracy. It is true that we have now gotten to a point, which didn't used to be true, so that's an improvement, where no matter what color somebody's skin, if they're a genius, if they're a genius at music, if they're intellectually a genius, if they're a sports genius, they are likely to find a way to rise. But that's a really important issue. You shouldn't have to be a genius to have an opportunity for a good and dignified life. That's a really big issue. Because there will be people who point to an Oprah or point to a to a Magic Johnson or point to a Tyler Perry. Well, he made it out. Yeah, but they're geniuses. So thank you very much. We're glad that's better than what happened to Bessie Smith. But it's not enough. And I think that that goes back to the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I think and that... When we, can, when we can put all of these issues in contrast and alignment with what our values, our perceived values are, there's a lot of power there, I believe, for persuade, for moral persuasion. That's why Martin Luther King said, we're not here to ask for new rights. We're here to cash a check. And Frederick Douglass spoke that way as well. And that's why you need to teach those kids. When I, when I was a child, and I, I don't know if you, when you were, uh, were growing up, did or not, did you, when you were at school, uh, put your hand in front mm -hmm. of your chest in the Pledge of Allegiance? Well, I went into some school and they weren't, te they weren't saying the Pledge of Allegiance. And I asked a friend who was with me why they weren't. And this friend of mine erupted. Because there is no liberty and justice for all. There's no fucking liberty and justice for all. And I said to him, yeah, but when I was a little girl, I put my hand in front of my heart. And I pledged allegiance, liberty and justice for all. And that's what turned me into a woman who gets really pissed when I see it not happening. The fact that I was taught as a child that it should be happening, not just by the morals of my parents or my religion, but also at school by what the purported values of this country are in terms of our constitution and our declaration of independence, that, that is what taught me what we're supposed to be fighting for and struggling for. So thank you for letting me say that. And also when you ask me, do I have anything to plug? Yes. Um, I am endorsing progressive uh, congressional candidates. And this goes back to what I said, you guys, we've got to elect new people. The reason we do not have policies that support working people is because we do not have enough working people making the policies, right? Mm -hmm. And so much of that is on the level of the primary. So I hope that you will go to CandidateSummit.com and see the incredible people that um, I've endorsed who are progressive candidates running all over the country. Um, these are obviously not the candidates who are getting, you know, corporate donations at all. But uh, if enough of us give the $1, give the $5, give the $10, it will make a difference, a big difference. And the time to get involved with that is now. So, yes, CandidateSummit.com. And I will be doing more of that kind of stuff. So if people go to Marianne.com and my social media and stuff, you'll see.
We will include all of those links in the show comments and in the video when we publish it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. And I do want to say... And I do want to say that if people want candidates to not take corporate donations, then that relies on us and small people uh, making up for that. So do keep that in mind when you go to those websites. There are no small people. There are small donations, but there are no small people. And that's what the system wants you to think, that the rest of us are small people. And that the American people have been trained to expect too little. And that... That right there goes against the grain. No, I mean, that's the whole idea of equality. We might have less money, but you know, when you look at, at candidates like Bernie Sanders proved, you know, with a lot of energy and small donations and we could do it. And uh, that everything else we're talking about, guys, none of it could happen if we don't have a massive change in the lawmaking class. As long as lawmaking itself is mainly at the behest of repressive forces, then there will be no change. So I hope that you and your friends will all go get real involved in running for office, changing things. Thank you so much, Marianne. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great to be with you guys. I appreciate it.